Hi, we Anders Warner. Welcome to Barbell Shrug. We are on YouTube today, not on the podcast. Uh, we're hanging out at Strength Feed in Raleigh, North Carolina. Sam Miller, he talks about men's health. And we're going to go on a deep dive into testosterone today. So, uh, dude, testosterone is like the craziest thing to me because in all the years of like getting into my 20s, into my 30s, this conversation, I've never met a single person that actually has the T levels that their body is supposed to. It seems like we're all faced with low T, which ends up in pellets, which ends up in exogenous um, testosterone. If you're really going down the rabbit hole, there's just endless, endless treatments for it. But I feel like it's more of a, there's natural remedies. But at the highest level, like what is testosterone and why do people have why is it so rampant that there's low testosterone these days? Yeah, so to simplify it, you know, testosterone is a reproductive hormone, uh, exists in both men and women. So a lot of people forget that women have testosterone as well. Uh, obviously we're focusing on men's health today. So it's the primary male androgen. And so it's responsible for all sorts of things from energy, our immune system, uh, cognitive function, actually low testosterone is associated with depression, anxiety, uh, even cardiovascular risk. So a lot of people think, oh, like high testosterone is bad for your heart. It's not really the case. You know, testosterone is necessary for overall optimal men's health and just well-being, recovering from the gym, feeling your best, um, and even performing well at work too. Uh, what is, why is it so rampant that everyone I talk to is trying to find a way to increase testosterone? Like what is it in our society or what are the systems in place that are really causing such low T in men? Yeah, I think it's kind of a multifaceted reason. You know, our, our lifestyles have really changed a lot. You know, we still have the same basic physiology. It's kind of like if you or I were to try and make content um, on like a typewriter, we can't do it. But we ask our body to do things that just seem ridiculous yeah. thinking about it. You know, thousands of years ago, we'd be walking around, maybe we're hunting, maybe we're gathering, just doing basic things, basic survival, just, you know, eating, sleeping, a lot of movement and right now you know we've gotten away from some of those primal tendencies we sit in front of a computer all the time we are on an iphone we could get an email you know from deborah and hr and we're stressed out for two weeks because of deborah, whatever happened deb, deb you know whatever janet you know, susan you know there's always <laughs> there's always, always somebody but deb uh, i feel like it's a deb and yeah. karen man yeah. deb and karen get a bad rap but anyway so you could get that stressful email. Um, we just live in a higher stress society, but I think we see a lot of changes in circadian rhythm as well. Uh, I think the statistic is we're at about anywhere from one third to one half of the testosterone that our either grandfathers or great grandfathers had. Uh, and depending on the study that you look at, the research, you know, people argue those semantics, but either way, it's not good, yeah. right? Like a third to half is just not where we want to be at all, uh, or excuse me, less than half. Um, and, and that's just, I think there's a lot of things that go into it. One, our, our food quality has changed, um, you know, the, our, our nature of stress, circadian rhythm, which that's basically our biological schedule. So sleep-wake cycles, um, lesser quality sleep. We've got a lot more going on in our environment in terms of things that influence other hormones in the body yeah. like cortisol, melatonin, and things like that. Yeah. When I think about like the system or the ecosystem that we live in, it's frightening how far away from nature it is right like us just being in this gym we had to create almost a playground for us to pick up heavy things where if you lived in the real world you'd have to go move trees or you'd have to go pick up rocks like all of this stuff would be just a part of your daily life and like being dirty there would you would never just be showering twice a day it doesn't make sense and now we're in this gym it's got these like fake fluorescent lights um, we've completely taken ourselves out of nature in yeah. as many ways as possible. Um, is there, are there simple solutions almost like where, where can people just start to like game the system a little bit just to like increase their exposure to natural elements, um, versus sitting in their office under fluorescent lights, you know, staring at a computer in this whole made up world that we live in. Right, you mentioned fake lights a lot, and that's one really simple thing too, is just getting a little bit more vitamin D, getting outside, light exposure, fresh air. Some people are big proponents of grounding. Uh, I think the main th theme here is what those things, what are those signaling to our body? Yeah. So, you know, initially when we were, you know, cave people, whatever you wanna call it, we would go outside, we'd get sunlight early in the day, and then once it was dark outside, we'd slowly wind down and go to sleep. We weren't watching Netflix, we weren't checking our iPhone, weren't doing emails, weren't on the laptop. 
and that blue light exposure can influence the pineal glands production of melatonin. So that's yeah. just another gland, kind of similar to your pituitary. And melatonin is that, that shot that fires that sort of signals that we're winding down for the day. It works sort of inversely to cortisol, which is that, that will release like before a workout or even when you drink caffeine, you get those catecholamines and different neurotransmitters firing. Um, so I think part of it has to do with cortisol levels. I think part of it is our, our exposure to these different things, these artificial lights, not getting enough sunlight. Uh, some of it's food quality. And I think also our, we have this significant change in our, in our nervous system and the way that we operate. So our nervous system is kind of like our operating system. We have a sympathetic state and a parasympathetic state. So the sympathetic state is more of that fight or flight or that drive, that go. Yeah. Um, whereas parasympathetic is that rest or digest. And I think where we're seeing a lot of changes is as we move into the 21st century, there's less variance between the two. Whereas, you know, even in our think about our grandfathers, there was probably either a time of intense work or you're pretty much relaxed and just hanging out. Yeah. And that's that's really and that's where we get into science like HRV, heart rate variability, and we're studying the difference of you know, for a crossfitter or power lifter or Olympic lifter or, you know, someone doing the one ton challenge, your ability to control your heart rate, the variability in post-workout, get back into that yeah. parasympathetic state is huge for recovery, but it does also play a role with testosterone levels as well because your nervous system, that psychological connection to the rest of your body, you can't tell me that's not influencing your hormone production and your endocrine system. I think a lot of people try to disconnect those and they teach very mechanistically. They're like, well, this is your nervous system and activation and this is your, yeah. these are your hormones and really like there's, those are very interwoven concepts. Yeah, I actually, when I'm lifting now, try to think about the creating as much intensity through like the load but being as calm as I possibly can while doing it. And a lot of that came from working with, uh, not working with, but when I interviewed Ben Pekulski, he's like super into- Oh, he loves that. Um, just the overall nervous system and how, um, how you recover and like going and doing like five minutes of meditation after you have an intense training session. Just anything you can do to take your body from the sympathetic state into the parasympathetic. Um, to wrap up part one though, like how, what are some of the signs that people can start to see in themselves as far as like when they might be experiencing low T um, and then once they go get tested, like what levels or where on that spectrum kind of should they be? Yeah, so it's important whether you're looking at something specific to hormones or not to track your biofeedback. Um, so big, easiest way to remember it is I call it shreds. So sleep, hunger, recovery, energy, digestion, and stress. Uh, oh, when those are out of balance, the end, you guys, yeah, Ooh. I know, <laughs> I know we're not going supplements, but you know, with, with those, anytime you see multiple areas of biofeedback changing, so you're lethargic, you're getting sick more often, changes in sleep, changes in recovery, um, brain fog, you know, that, that's a huge thing. Libido and sex drive is another big one. Uh, but for a lot of guys I, I've noticed, you know, we can still have that normal reproductive function, but really be, you know, maybe you're getting sick more often. Yeah. Uh, you're seeing changes in other areas of your life, maybe not quite that excitement or drive uh, because testosterone is closely related with, you know, other things going on in the body as well. So I'd say the first thing is check your biofeedback before you even need to get labs. Yeah. Um, that's going to be a key driver and, and make sure you're, you know, you're uh, crossing your T's and dotting your I's. Like if you're not sleeping, you're not eating enough, there's some really easy ways to improve that. I think we're going to talk about that yeah. in the next couple episodes. Uh, make sure you get down into the description. Uh, and um, as we get into nutrition, what are just some ways that we can gain the system for creating meals or creating a plan, a long-term kind of approach to increasing testosterone? Yeah, I think so paying attention to your toggles with nutrition. So a lot of people stay in one place for too long. So they'll, they'll be in a caloric surplus for too long, they'll be in a caloric deficit for too long. And either one of those things, as we move away from moderation, our body doesn't really like that. It can perceive that as stress. So an extreme example would be, you know, a guy who eats too much and is and active all the time, that's type two diabetes. Yeah. You know, on the other side, you know, anorexia, not eating enough, having disordered eating, you know, that person really needs a reverse diet. When we live at either of those extremes, we see folks who have lower testosterone levels. Now, granted, you may not be sitting at home, you know, living in that extreme, but um, anything that sort of hedges that direction or we don't pay attention to periodization or recovery, 
that's really when those things are compromised. So from a macro year long perspective, make sure you ebb and flow and spend time in different areas, spend time in yeah. a muscle gain phase, spend time at maintenance. I know it's not attractive for most people, but maintenance is one of the best things you could possibly do. And then spending time in a deficit deliberately to restore insulin sensitivity and also lose some body fat. Um, I think one of the issues is when we, when we don't plan those deficits, uh, when we have higher levels of body fat, we can run into issues where we're converting a lot of that testosterone into estrogen. Or we have other forms of hormone dysregulation in the body, so that's super important to pay attention to as well. Yeah. Um, that and then post-workout nutrition. I think a lot of people leave that on the table as well. Yeah, what is actually a, a good side? I'm really interested in what a, a, a healthy cycle and kind of a, a macro year-long approach looks like because um, I personally like to do like a three month, like super intense tracking macros, making sure I'm hitting everything, um, annoying people because I really want to be dialed in. And then the rest of the year, I find that like, I can stay in maintenance much easier until Thanksgiving hits and then the wheels fall off for six weeks. But is there like a flow to the year that we've seen keeps people healthier? Uh, I think it's going to depend on the person. So if you came to me at a higher level of body fat, you might need to spend more of 2020 in a deficit. Whereas someone who's already very lean might need to spend more time reverse dieting or at maintenance. So it's very context dependent. So I hate to say that there's one yeah. protocol only, um, but taking your time with either one, like don't race to the bottom and also don't make like yeah. a thousand calories swing up. I think that would be my best advice from like a uh, overall planning perspective. Yeah, so you mentioned reverse dieting a couple times, but how do people go about that? If you're, um, it's kind of like the crash diet or just instantly overeating if you're kind of on the super lean eating disorder side of um, the spectrum. But what is like a, an actual approach to getting people in the reverse yeah. diet? And that could even be, so mentioning that is, you know, you could be running a calorie deficit just because you're so active. You may not theoretically be under eating for your size, but your activity level and energy balance puts you there. And you may be thinking, well, I don't have an eating disorder. I don't under eat, yeah. but it's all relative to your activity level and your performance. So if you're yeah. an athlete and you're training twice a day, you really need to pay attention to, well, you, you're, what's normal for you is not what's normal for yeah. other people. So that's, I've seen that a lot with athletes as well who need to reverse that. I see that, that more with athletes that they're starving, not starving themselves, but they think they're eating a lot because they're not tracking and they're full or they're yeah. used to eating this, but they don't realize that they just took on like a, a new training plan with tons of volume right. or they're doing some like massive squat cycle, like big, heavy compound lifts all the time for heavy, high reps. And then all of a sudden they look at yeah. them like, well, they're only eating 2,200 calories a day. It's like, you yeah. gotta feed the beast. Right. And whether it's you know neurological stress like heavy lifts, um, more hypertrophy stress or that sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, or you're dealing with a lot of metabolic or oxidative stress in the liver, nutrition is one of the best ways to combat that uh, along with proper recovery and what we said about managing those nervous system states. I kind of view those as like drains and charges. And so reverse diet is kind of an example of a way you could charge someone, like an athlete who's training a lot, got a lot of volume, maybe two days, and they're under eating, more food is actually charging their system. Just think of it like an iPhone battery, right? Yeah. So that's um, where I'd like to start with them is just have them track for a little bit and then just gradually add small amounts as digestion permits. Um, you don't really wanna get to a place where you're either adding scale weight too quickly or you're really uncomfortable. Some people will add too much food and then they get a lot of digestive distress. Yeah. You kind of wanna find that happy medium where you're seeing an increase in energy, you're sleeping better, and your appetite maybe even up comes up a little bit yeah. with adding food uh, without ending up in a spot where you're um, really uncomfortable or you know maybe having some issues going to the bathroom and things like that. For when people are in, even if you're kind of in that over fat or for males like tw over 20% body fat and you need to be in a deficit, is there a problem of being in a caloric deficit for six to eight, maybe 12 months straight um, without kind of just getting back to maintenance and letting your body stabilize again? Yeah, and that's where something like interval dieting might be handy or carb cycling um, or like the Matador approach or some research on that. There's really, there's not a ton that we have, uh, but we do see transient hormonal changes in people who diet naturally for things like bodybuilding competitions and things like that. So someone who's really, really overweight 
does need a period of caloric restriction because they're going to benefit from the insulin sensitivity that's improving yeah. from eating less carbohydrate uh, or just total calories. Calorie deficits are a great way to improve insulin sensitivity. Um, and then also having less body fat, we start to see a little bit of downregulation in an enzyme called aromatase. And what that enzyme does is it converts testosterone to estrogen. So as you lose body fat, you tend to get a little bit less of that process going on. So you essentially have more of your testosterone available to do what it's supposed to do. I think the problem is some people have quote unquote normal levels, but they don't see the pathways that the, so testosterone is kind of this like molecule that can turn into different things in the body. It can either be bound to things, it can convert to estrogen. Um, and that's where someone who is overweight, that's really where they see the benefits in testosterone is the derivatives and the pathways and things like that. So losing, you know, I would say, you know, they could do six to eight weeks, they could do 12. I think once you get past 16 to 20 weeks, you really need to think about coming up for air, yeah. uh, maybe a maintenance period, reverse diet, because you eventually run out of, you know, wiggle room essentially to continue to push that calorie deficit. Yeah. Um, so you wanna come back up, give yourself a little buffer and then subtract again, because eventually you run out of room. And then I, I run into a lot of folks who are, haven't reverse dieted and they've only done a calorie deficit and they're like, where do I go from here? Yeah. And I'm like, well, you're only eating 1100 calories, so you gotta go up. You yeah. can't, we're not gonna go down to 900, right? So that's an example of where nutritional periodization can be really handy, whether it's a weight loss goal or yeah. anything like that. I actually also find when somebody's gone, say four months, six months into being in a deficit, they don't know anything else. So they don't actually know what like Good energy feels like right and they just constantly get stuck kind of like feeling slow feeling like they just need a little bit more um, and then they just continually drop calories and they don't understand that like you gotta like you said come up for air um, what is a the calories in calorie out, calories out approach is like very good for many many people as like concept but when you get into food quality um, does that have a massive impact on, I'm, I'm like as anti, if it fits your macros as we could possibly get, like I just hate that whole concept. Um, yes, it can work for weight loss, but where on like a hormonal side of things is, does that not work? And how, how important is the food quality? They're, they're both pretty equally important. So anyone who says that caloric quantity doesn't matter in driving your, your hormones, it's pretty, pretty much been disproven. Uh, but, and calorie quality is hard to prove unless it's from a micronutrient perspective. So we know, you know, for guys, we need zinc, we need you know, essential vitamins and minerals. Um, you know, even things like selenium can influence the thyroid, which then influences testosterone. Uh, but it's really, it's really hard to pinpoint and say one set diet is best for testosterone levels. Uh, but we do know that having more nutrient dense foods is going to be, be beneficial just from a longevity yeah. and overall health perspective. And, you know, having that, we're sort of filling in the gaps. Now, could you if, hit your macros, eat Pop-Tarts and eat a multivitamin? Yes, yeah. but it's really not the same. We also have to think about um, from a digestive perspective and just other factors beyond uh, just the calorie component, you know, what value am I getting out of that? Um, you know, we, we want to mix too. And it's okay to have some foods that aren't just, you know, boring vegetables all the time, yeah. but um, you have to remember like what's the trade-off and, and what are we losing. So I'm, uh, I definitely land in the middle. I think it's, it's very, very important to have an idea of your overall calories, but you can't abandon food quality because yeah. you'll just end up, um, I think, shooting yourself in the foot, yeah. especially with something like testosterone levels too. I think those people who, who solely do, if it fits your macros, begin to struggle with things like appetite regulation, um, they, they do struggle with certain micronutrient deficiencies and you'll see it somewhere in the labs uh, if you do decide to do blood work, even if it's not necessarily apparent from just your training. Yeah. But, you know, we could take the same 3000 calorie diet and I'm sure with some tweaks, you know, person A uh, on the food quality program might feel a little bit better than person B. Yeah, you talk about training, make sure you get into the description, uh, click the link for the testosterone guide, uh, men's health, uh, get over there, check it out. Uh, in part three, we're going to talk about training. And as we get into training, um, my background in CrossFit, as much as I loved and still love parts of that training, I feel like um, we really got into seeing how far we could overtrain our bodies and still sort of live. Um, but I really started to become aware of um, like people with poor testosterone levels and the overtraining side of things 
when I was competing in CrossFit. And it, was, it, it seemed like our, our sole focus was to push ourselves as far as we could, go a little bit further, but we never fully understood like what a deload week was or um, how to periodize a year because it was just go, go, go. None of us had the knowledge. We, we just weren't in that mindset. Um, when people come to you and they're, they're experiencing kind of the low energy levels, uh, maybe like some signs of depression, they don't have um, excitement to get to the gym. Um, what are some of the, kind of like the, the checklist of going through someone's training program and assessing where they're at and kind of taking steps forward? I think you always want to check and see if someone's progressing. Do they have drive to actually go to the gym? Are they enjoying their program? Uh, I think people forget that with you know too much training volume, anytime we're exceeding our body's ability to recover, there's going to be a stress response there. Yeah. Um, and that stress response is what we see in terms of then that hormone, when we have additional cortisol in the body, starts to influence you know that androgen production. Because your body's basically saying, well, why would I want to make more reproductive hormone when you're already putting me through all of this yeah. stress as it is? Cue kind of that dude we were talking about in the first part of the series from a thousand years ago, to him, if he's moving all this stuff around and he's super stressed and he's overworked, is that really a safe environment to bring in a baby? No, yeah. not really. Does it make sense to, you know, our bodies are basically these misers of energy. We conserve energy, regulate energy to keep us alive. So your body kind of goes into this more antiquated approach of, well, how do I save energy? Well, I can downregulate thyroid hormone, I can downregulate testosterone, and cortisol will break down more energy in the body, which will free it up for that next training session where you're gonna kill yourself. Yeah. And that, when you do that long enough, that's where you see people run into some issues with like adrenal insufficiency and things like that. So yeah. I, always, I always look at like drive to actually go to the gym, recover, recovery, um, are you progressing on your lifts? Because you should have some metric-based movements in yeah. there, whether you're doing powerlifting, strongman, bodybuilding, having some metric-based movements. And then your accessory work, that's where you know, you can sort of adjust your volume accordingly. Yeah. But I think that's a great place to start. For I love people. that too. If you, do you feel like you're getting stronger? Probably doing okay. Um, I feel like on the, the men's side of things, we always talk about testosterone and low T, and then you right. get to the female side and they always say that they have adrenal fatigue. Is there a difference? Do they, do they, it seems like they, they have this fun little balance with each other. Yeah. Um, with the same symptoms, it's just different how we talk about them. Yeah, I think some people mistake one for the other and, and vice versa. I mean, guys can certainly struggle with, you could have a testosterone issue that's rooted in, you know, uh, adrenals, thyroid, and gut health, or yeah. you could have a testosterone issue that's just solely, um, you know, maybe you had a pituitary injury or tra traumatic brain injury, concussion, something like that, that's influencing your pituitary. Uh, but what the, the way the adrenals sort of relate is when we have a lot of production of cortisol, that inhibits this regulatory protein that allows us to make androgens. So in men, the reason we're associating it with low T and not just what's going on with the adrenals is because we will feel it impacting that sex hormone production, that testosterone yeah. production. Um, and that's uh, very, very specific. So a lot of people don't go into the science of that, but it's just called star protein. Basically is a regulatory protein that helps us uh, makes our cells make more testosterone. And so anytime you have this over uh, abundance of stress, you're gonna see this down regulation. And so I always remind people, and we don't need to get super into the science in that sense, it's just these systems are all connected. They're not in silos. Like if your yeah. adrenals think there's a problem, if your thyroid is perceiving, or your technically it would be your brain, right? So it'd be your hypothalamus, your pituitary. But if they're sensing a problem and they're pulling resources from one area or down regulating one, eventually the other one's gonna go. It's just kind of like, which one's going first. Yeah. Um, you know, if you had a three-legged stool and, and one starts to go, you know, or you, you're having a compromised structure, you're gonna end up with a problem. So I think that's why men associate it that way. I think it's also just, where is the education in, in media, or like for guys, it's like you see commercials, it's low T. Yeah. It's not your adrenals. I think with women, oftentimes they're marketed to in a certain way. Uh, you know, we don't talk, we talk about adrenals or we talk about post birth control syndrome and things like that or thyroid, and guys are just quick to hop on the well, it's my testosterone. Well, yeah. did you think that reverse dieting, sleeping more, getting your adrenals under control, having more parasympathetic activity, and getting your thyroid in the right place like naturally, that's gonna be really good for yeah. your testosterone levels as a dude. It's probably also gonna free up a lot of that active hormone that you're making naturally already. Way. When I talk to a lot of crossfitters or when I talk to kind of like pure strength athletes that are going after it and attacking it really hard, um, they love to 
bang intensity and hang out all the way on the extreme side of like heavyweights fast all the time. And then you ask them how often they train, how slow they can go. And the conversation gets really quiet, like showing up to a yin yoga class or like how slow can you actually move as well to actually be training your body on the full spectrum of movement or intensities. And the conversation gets really awkward really quick because that scene is completely pathetic. Um, do you incorporate like a lot of meditation or down regulation tactics like that, um, yoga classes to kind of balance people out when they first yeah. come to you? I think it depends. Like for a lot of people, they're already stressed with their current life. And so to give them another thing to check off, it may put them in a place of overwhelm. So I try to start with the basics. It's like, what's something that you liked doing as a kid that you no longer do as an adult? Did you play guitar? Do you like to draw? Yeah. Do you like music? Do you like to walk outside? Do you play sports? Yeah. You know, those things just bring people more happiness and joy and like they're gonna, that's, that's a good part of recovery. Um, you know, not everyone is great at meditating. For some people, you know, it might be switching a particular day of your lift. Like maybe you hate traditional cardio, you wanna go swim, you wanna go for a hike. I think that's uh, an area of improvement. Just getting outside. A lot of people, if they have pets, I'll just be like, dude, just go walk your dog, yeah. like, relax. Walking is um, awesome. Yeah, walking, walking is a great parasympathetic activity. You're, it's one of the few things you can do that are actually, it's increasing calorie expenditure and your NEAT, which is a huge, yeah. I mean, we could do a whole series on metabolism, yeah. but you're increasing your non-exercise activity without straining that central nervous system, which usually, oftentimes with these athletes, is already firing a little bit too much. Yeah. So you get that, um, but you know, it could be an example simple as like for me, like I know I should spend more time like with music or playing guitar. I, if I don't do a good job of that, um, you know, I'm not spending a lot of time on recovery. Other people want to read a book. Uh, it's really what's going to kind of have that you know, shutting down effect. Yeah. Um, some people like yoga. If you can make time for yoga, that's great. But if it's going to stress you out to go drive across town and do yoga, you're going to defeat the purpose yeah. of what you're doing. And some of these people are already so active, like, pulling additional recovery resources. I would do resources. anything to find a dark room where I could just lay down and breathe just, for an yeah. hour. It's right. the greatest. Yeah. It's like the exact opposite of what my normal day is like. Right. I feel like that was when I found yin yoga, it was like the healthiest thing that ever entered into my life because I could just, it was just quiet. Yeah. And it was dark and there was no phone, there was no anything and it just changed everything about like just my perception of overall health and what I needed to be doing to train the other side of the spectrum of the intensity that I've been cranking for the last 20 years. And I think that's important too, like your perception of that activity, like that's what's relaxing for you. Other people, it might make them anxious yeah. to be in a dark room by themselves for an hour. Um, and that's why, so even when talking about testosterone, I try to make it super, super simple. It's whether you're a CrossFitter, your strength athlete, your bodybuilder, you have some type of physical goal. Um, usually it's you either want fat loss or you want greater performance, you want to squat more, but all of that's always preceded by your physiology and that's yep. the testosterone, that's what we're talking about in this series. But the, that testosterone and that physiology is preceded by your daily practices, which is like, okay, your meditation, habits, routines, rituals, your macros, your, your calorie, are you, are you eating you know, good quality foods? Are you sleeping enough? Like that's a practice. And then what you said about like that mental state that you achieved and your relationship with that activity, that exercise, that's perception. Yeah. Those, you know, that's kind of what I incorporate into a model. Like anytime I talk about a transformation or I'm talking to other coaches, trying to teach them how to apply this stuff, it's like, let's look at this person in the spectrum and like, how are they trying to get to their physical goal when their physiology is all jacked up? It usually originates, unless they have like a genetic trauma or like a, um, an injury of some kind, yeah. most of the time it's gonna come back to these basic things. Like eating enough food, sleeping enough, you know, what type of recovery protocols do you implement? And, you know, do you have a good relationship with exercise? Or are you doing CrossFit 14 times a week because, like, you're miserable about something else in your life? Yeah. Like, I think that's where we have to zoom out and, like, have some perspective. Uh, get into the description. There's a free men's health guide to testosterone uh, written by Sam. And where can people find you? SamMillerScience.com or the podcast. SamMillerScience.com. What's the name of the podcast? Sam Miller Science. Sam Miller Science. Make sure you check out episode three. Yeah, you're on three. I'm number four. three. Three or four. Three or four. Check it out. We're popular in Slovakia. <laughs> we're huge in Slovakia. They heard the name Anders. They were like, yeah. that's my people. Yeah. Um, get into the description. Free guide to men's health and testosterone. And we'll see you guys next week. So part four of the testosterone series, just want to talk about uh, sleep and recovery um, and how that plays into testosterone. Uh, we all hear the eight hours a night. I don't do that.
I got a baby. It doesn't work. This morning, I woke up at 3 to a crying baby. I didn't even have to do anything. And then I woke up at 6. That's not un uninterrupted sleep. You know what I did? 40 ounces of coffee. <laughs> what a morning, right? Um, but when, uh, when we start talking about the hormone side of things, uh, tea specifically, um, like, does eight hours of sleep really matter or is it about the quality of sleep? Um, how does all that play into understanding testosterone? Yeah, I think you've got to do the best that you can with you know, both a mix of quality and quantity. We know that when we have uninterrupted sleep, we can go through the different sleep cycles. So we've got light sleep, REM sleep, and then delta or uh, slow wave sleep. And so the, the struggle is, is that the, the more interrupted this sleep is, we're ending up with less time in either delta sleep or slow wave sleep, um, less time in REM and, and maybe more light sleep. Yeah. And that can be problematic for athletes, but you, know, you can increase your total quantity of sleep, try to take a nap, um, you know, as situations permit, try to uh, hack your sleep in certain ways. And, and if people can't necessarily get more sleep, how do we enhance quality of sleep? Can we make the room a little cooler? Can we change your nighttime routine where as soon as, like your sleep latency is basically how long does it take you to fall asleep as soon as your yeah. head hits the pillow? I think a lot of people leave a lot on the table in terms of, well, once you're actually in bed, how much, like, how much time are you asleep in bed? Yeah. Or are we, you know, have, you know, as a culture now, it's like, well, let's watch Netflix before you go to bed. And then you've got like a TV in there, blue light, whatever. Um, so keeping your bedroom as a place where it's like so, solely sleep focused and making sure it's an optimal environment for you to actually get deep yeah. sleep and recovery is, is incredibly important. I can't wait to tell you about how bad of a system I had last night. I watched the Aaron Hernandez documentary oh. right before going to sleep. And I laid there for like an hour and a half because my body was just like overly fried on how ridiculous that guy's life is. And then I woke up at three and then I woke up at six. <laughs> I woke up this morning and I was like, that was so terrible. Yeah. How am I going to survive today? This is ridiculous. Yeah. Um, I mean, we all have those days. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, sure. sometimes you wake up and it's like, did I send that email or did I do that <laughs> yeah. thing? I mean, I, there's always something that's on your mind. I think making it as habitual and having a routine can be super yes. helpful. So what does that routine look like uh, for many people? Because, I mean, I'd love to say I have one. I actually do the majority of any meditation or breath work while I'm laying in bed because it seems like it's the only 10 to 20 minutes that I 100% own is, is laying in bed. But um, how long do you kind of recommend and what does that system look like? So this is context dependent. Like how strung out are you as a person? Like the higher up you are yeah. at five, six, seven, eight, nine p.m., you gotta come down eventually, right? So it's like, how do we get you to come down? Um, some people just need, you know, eliminate some blue light, get in a dark space, read yeah. a little bit. Uh, other people have to go as far as like contrast hydrotherapy and or like a hot shower and a lot of unplug time, you know, and, and moving towards that. You know, some people can fall asleep pretty quickly without, you know, much assistance. And I think that's where, you know, having a coach can be helpful because you can find out individually what's working for you. I've got a guy that sleeps better just when we add more carbs at night. And all we did was pull it from earlier in the day, yeah. moved a meal back a little bit. Other people, if you put food close to bed, they sleep terribly because they don't digest it very well. Yeah. So it's paying attention to your individual biofeedback and trying to come up with a structure. Also, you know, be realistic and honest with yourself, like how stressful is my day to day? And like what do things look like until seven, eight, nine p.m.? Let's say you're yeah. trying to go to bed at 10 or 11. You know, what do things look like before that? Because it's not just the 30 minutes before bed. It's okay, after work, how am I setting myself up yep. for, you know, having, having that time? Um, the devices, like the Whoop Band, uh, Aura Ring, yes, do you follow? Aura. Oh, that actually is an Aura, Aura Ring, yeah. look at that. How yep. much do you pay attention to that? So, it depends. If I know that I'm gonna be severely jet lagged or travel, I'll actually put it on like airplane mode, so it actually signals it later on, because it's surprisingly accurate. So yeah. when you have shitty feedback, it almost gets in your head, you're like, oh, I can't train hard today because yeah. I, I feel like crap. Um, but it's helpful to monitor your HRV, your readiness score. Uh, it does a great job of predicting for me when I'm gonna get sick. So, for example, before Christmas, I actually came down with something and the readiness score and my body temperature and respiration rate started to change. And that's how I knew for me that like, okay, I gotta emphasize recovery, I need to take some time yeah. off in the gym and focus on that and nutrition, uh, hydration, things like that. Uh, Whoop, I actually tried Whoop for a little bit. Um, 
for me, I think as they change, adjust the bracelet and like improve some things, um, I, I certainly liked it. I enjoyed the interface. I think it's good technology if you want to try it. I already had an Aura Ring, so um, I'm not associated with either of these companies. Yeah. But they're both. I mean, they're both good tools. But all it is is a tool. You can sort of gamify the system as much yeah. as you want. But I mean, you're going to know too. Don't be so reliant on technology that you're not paying attention to what's going on inside you as yeah. a person. Like your body basically does its own lab work all the time yeah. and we just don't pay attention. We're so numb to what's going on. It's like we don't even realize, well, like I feel like crap today or like I feel like I have really good energy. What yeah. did I do yesterday and the day before yeah. that set me up for success today? So they're tools, I definitely like them. I think we're learning more about HRV as the research comes out um, and as we have more, like I've got more anecdotal data from working with clients. But uh, you know, I think it, it can be a good way to reinforce some good habits and also make you aware of maybe things like that you weren't aware that you were doing. Yeah, I worked with Whoop for all of last year, and I found um, early in wearing it, it was really cool. And then I really liked all the data. And then, um, and this is what I recommended to a lot of people was like find a couple like objective measures. Um, the red, yellow, and green probably isn't like the most objective measure. That's kind of like this we idea that they've created like the right thing for you. So if you can follow like total time that you're actually asleep or find a deep sleep, like find one or two things that that band is testing. Um, and you can do it with the aura ring too, I'm sure, but find yeah. one or two things that that band is testing that are purely objective measures and just track those. Like the calorie thing, they have no idea how many calories. They were telling me I'm supposed to eat like 4,500 calories a day. Don't do that. Um, but like total time in bed, how long it takes for you to fall asleep. Like find one or two that you can actually um, objectively track and, and stick to those that are important to you. Um, and then leave a lot of the subjective stuff. Just yep. that be, let that be its thing and um, see how you feel based on those more objective measures. Um, when it comes to actually getting into the gym and training though, and like recovery, we talked in part one about like, uh, Ben Pakulski says like, go and do five minutes of like breath work right after, so you can get into that parasympathetic as quick as possible. Um, but strategies to kind of ramp yourself up to an intense training session. Um, and then how do people recover as quickly as possible getting out of that training? You mean besides 40 ounces of coffee? Cause I'm pretty sure that should be probably going to do 20 more as soon as I leave more, here, just to get to excited for night yeah. training session. Today's just a not, not a healthy day. <laughs> not healthy day. Yeah. I mean, you can ramp yourself up. Like there, there's obviously some really great, you know, both anecdotal and research on caffeine. Yeah. You know, it can, it can definitely enhance your training session. Um, but I think it can also mask your true drive for training and like how you're actually doing. Uh, I tend to focus a little bit more on, on kind of like post-workout and what you're doing as far as, you know, uh, just getting, getting back into a place in that parasympathetic state or, or setting your body up for recovery. Uh, you can use intra-workout nutrition for that. You can use post-workout nutrition. Uh, carbs and just insulin alone will sort of bring down that cortisol level that you're experiencing. As far as pre-workout nutrition, it's having enough nutrients to support recovery without actually making you sleepy. Yeah. And so you can play around with that. Some people do well with a mix of protein and carbs. Some people need kind of straight protein um, or like a, a mix of that with a little bit of fat and they do okay. I think where people run into issues is like don't have a super fatty meal pre-workout and you're gonna be lethargic and kind yeah. of sluggish as you move through. And then depending on you know, you're, there's even folks who get as far as into like the, your actual neurological type with, with training and how that influ influences your nutrition, the type of work that you're doing. But I think having some like pre-activation work, just dynamic warm up, moving in, you know, have some intra workout nutrition and then have a meal, like don't stress out about it, but like have yeah. a meal sometime after, that's just all gonna help bring you back into a better place for recovery. Yeah. Right on. We go uh, talking about tea in part one. Make sure you get over part two for nutrition, training in part three, recovery in part four. If you need the whole thing, we'll be posting next week the full interview with Sam Miller. Uh, get into the description. There's a free men's health guide to testosterone uh, written by Sam. And where can people find you? SamMillerScience.com or the podcast. SamMillerScience.com. What's the name of the podcast? Sam Miller Science. Sam Miller Science. Make sure you check out episode three. Yeah, you're on three. I'm or number four. three. Right, three or four. Three or four. Check it out. We're popular in Slovakia. <laughs> we're huge in Slovakia. They heard the name Anders. They were like, yeah. that's my people. Yeah. Um, get into the description, free guide to men's health and testosterone, and we'll see you guys next week.